Hey, <laughs> we're live. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Melanie Yazzie, co-host of Red Power Hour. I've been gone for a beat. Um, Elena and I recorded, we recorded like a year, end of year episode in December. Then we recorded another one in January. I don't even remember what it was because so much has happened since then, but we had promised to have regular Red Power Hour episodes every two weeks from that point forward. And ha, that didn't happen because <laughs> it's the end of March of 2024. Um, so really sorry for being gone for so long. I'm joined by my beautiful, brilliant comrade, Justine Tiba here for Red Power Hour because Elena got really sick. Yep. What's up, Justine? Hey, everyone. JT back in the building. What's up? Tiba Hut. <laughs> Tiba Hut. <laughs> Mel and the Tiba Hut here. Okay, power hour. I gotta say why though, because it's it's so silly. It's it's literally just because there's a sandwich shop down the block called Chiba Hut that we go to sometimes, and and that's why I'm called Tiba Hut in in the I'm in the in the org. <laughs> it's so funny that you just took the time to explain that because I just thought it required no explanation because it's so like drilled into my brain <laughs> like your name yeah. <laughs> but no is Chiba Hut like a national chain or is that just an Albuquerque thing I I think it's only in some select regions so there'll be, <laughs> be people like what the hell does that mean <laughs> Well, I hope it's okay that I dropped that here on the podcast, and thank you for explaining that. The origins Absolutely. of that name for our listeners. I, I am so proud of my last name. <laughs> it's actually uh, from Fort Defiance, Tiba. It's a, is it? It is. It's a branch of the Metibas. So, oh, oh. yeah. I always, oh. I always drop the Navajo card once in a while just to be like hey i have i'm also i am my great grandfather was navajo what the heck how did i never make the connection that tiba is a shortened version of the matiba name which is like there are a lot of navajo families in in the fort area I, it's funny because there's also um one of my cousins he goes by jay and i also go by jay but our political views are opposite ends of the spectrum <laughs> So the the Tiba Hut the Tiba Hut nickname really matters in terms of the politics the political weight behind that nickname. <laughs> follow follow the J Tiba AKA Tiba Hut not the other J. The lefty Tiba. The lefty Tiba. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I um I got COVID also at the very beginning of February. Well, I got like really terrible food poisoning, and then I got COVID immediately after that, and then I got long COVID. <laughs> immediately oh. after that so um just yeah I just like physically couldn't record an episode I had this terrible cough for like a month up until maybe like two weeks ago um I've been having to teach during this time it's been it's just been awful yeah I couldn't like I couldn't just sit on a podcast and talk for an hour without like coughing my lungs up but yeah so I'm I'm on the mend but it's like it's slow it's a slow burner um, we're now getting like two feet of snow here in Minnesota Makoche as well. So winter hasn't ended. So yeah, it's snowing right now. It's kind of wild. Dang. We're going to get like 20 inches in the next two days. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, your windows are looking extra bright today. Yep. It's that light reflecting off of all the white snow all over the ground. But anyway, that's just the reason why, um, I have not recorded and Elena's sick. Elena's sick again. Um, not with COVID this time, but Yeah. The Rona, it's the Rona um, really affecting our ability to be here to record the podcast. So again, apologies for being absent for so long. But yeah, today we're just going to do um, a bit of like a current event. Well, some of this stuff happened actually like six months ago, but I've been wanting to talk about it for several months. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of a, a, a roundup of some important things that are happening uh, in Turtle Island. And mostly related to the land, land back, decolonization and water. Um, I wanted to actually, I'll be recording another episode. Hopefully our next RPH episode will be about all of the stuff that's happening with the Colorado River. Um, so much stuff happening around the settlement of water rights um, and like the fights that have been going on. 
I know many listeners have probably heard me talk about the Colorado River because I just I've done a lot of research on it before from a Navajo water rights perspective um, over the years of RPH. And so I want to do a special episode on that, maybe our next episode. But I need to do a little bit more research before we do that. But I'm going to talk about another river today, uh, the Klamath River in California. And this story, uh, there was a massive story with a really um, nicely done like 10 minute documentary that came out on October 5th of 2023 in the LA Times, the Los Angeles Times. And the Yurok tribe, as well as uh, just grassroots activists, um, often women and community members organized for 20 years um, to essentially decolonize that river, meaning um, they were advocating for removing four dams from that river. So the Klamath River starts up in like Oregon and then comes down and empties into the coast in Northern California. And a 20 year struggle, they actually won, they won. And the first dam, the smallest of the four dams was removed actually in the summer of 2023. And it made international news um, in October of 2023. Uh, but then of course, um, Gaza happened on October 7th, and for very good reason, I think all of our attention um, was turned to Gaza and the ongoing genocide. And most of my attention, my organizing, my intellectual, my political, um, anything that I could contribute, right, to stopping, to, to getting a ceasefire um, and stopping the genocide in Gaza became the priority. Um, but I had seen the story from the LA Times just kind of flash across my screen. I think someone shared it with me actually in my email. And I just felt like it was important to return to that and to talk about that here um, because it is the largest dam removal project. So dam removal has been happening in the US for a few years now. And it's been mostly happening in like the Pacific Northwest. Um, but this particular dam removal um, project is the largest in US history. And Again, it was spearheaded almost entirely by Yurok um, indigenous folks. The Yurok tribe, this is actually related to Palestine. If you recall, at the beginning of November of 2023, the Yurok Tribal Council issued the first um, statement of solidarity with Palestine, the ceasefire, um, calling for a ceasefire of any uh, indigenous nation or tribal council. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they were the first ones to issue that statement. Do you remember that? And then it like kind of went viral on social media. I remember it happening, but I, I don't recall the tribe, but that is amazing that it was them. It's them. So when I, I was like, wait, I think it was the Yurok who issued that statement. And then I went and looked it up and I was like, yeah, like that happened at the very beginning of November. And so this is the same. So the Yurok um, nation is the largest nation in California, indigenous nation in California. And whatever they're doing, um, I was, I'm going to talk about another project that they've been working on with the National Park Service. But whatever the Yurok tribe is doing is kind of like goals, I would say, for indigenous nationhood and tribal sovereignty in the U.S. Um, because they're obviously doing like very powerful, very purposeful, like extremely well organized decolonization and land back work. Because to I don't know how long the Klamath River is, but uh, to get a four hundred and fifty million dollar project to get it funded to get all the parties and the entities that are a part of the, who have like a stake in that river and in those dams um, to get on board, including the state of California, which is like essentially its own nation state. <laughs> I think the economy of California is like the eighth largest economy in the world, like the world, um, not just in the US. And so California is its own, like its own thing. Um, so getting the state of California to agree, um, the dams are run by a public utility called Pacificor which is um, Warren Buffett, the billionaire, is a subsidiary of his um, company. I forgot what the company is called. Uh, so getting the, the corporation to agree, um, getting all the legal stuff put together, uh, and then getting community members to agree, all the communities who live along the river, uh, is an incredible feat. And the, so the dams being removed is a big deal, not just for the health of the river, but mostly for the salmon. And if folks have paid attention to like the fish wars, so back in the 1970s, um, the US government really cracked down on Yurok fishing rights. And they won a very a landmark, I believe it was a Supreme Court case, but they were highly criminalized. Like they were brutalized by, by the feds. 
Um, many of them were arrested. They were beaten um, for refusing to give up their fishing rights, particularly to salmon in the Klamath River. And so you fast forward, we're what, like 45 years later um, for something like this to happen and for them to have persevered and organized for the removal of these dams for the protection of salmon who are their relatives. And it's like the lifeblood of who they are. Like their identity as indigenous people is wrapped up with the river and it is expressed through the health and the well-being of the salmon population that spawns upstream and then comes out um, into the Pacific Ocean uh, at, the, at the, the estuary where the ocean meets the riverhead, um, the river mouth in Northern California. And so to go from like that 45 years ago to where they are now, I think, first of all, I think that shows you just like the length of what decolonization struggles entail and require. But I don't know, it's just like incredibly inspiring. It's incredibly, I don't know what else to say. And that isn't, and it's not like community members pitted against like tribal council. They were really, truly interested in engaging everyone in the process because they knew that that is what would be required to like free the salmon um, by freeing the river. And so, yeah, there's gonna be all of this like reclamation work that's gonna happen. Um, salmon populations have increased. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because I felt like maybe it hadn't gotten enough coverage even though it is an actual like physical concrete example of decolonization. Like one of the, the women who led um, some of like the grassroots charge to free the river from the dams she actually said, she like, this is the official end of the colonization of this river, like the, the removal of these dams and just allowing the river to flow and the salmon to repopulate naturally. And I kind of like, um, kind of like I took an intake of breath when I read that because I was like, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And as we're dealing, you know, as we're kind of moving towards land back in the movement here, um, that is an, like a landmark, I think, example of land back and water back that I felt was maybe underreported, even though it is incredibly important. That's absolutely true. I can't believe I'm just learning about this today, right now, <laughs> in this recording session. I, and, uh, you know, I was going through similar feelings this weekend about the underreporting and sort of, um, you know, once well, once everything in Gaza started happening, it's like everything took a pause or um, or not a pause, but like um, like the entirety of our media attention went to where it had to go, like rightfully. But right now we're. Um, Oh, I mean, several months passed and we're coming to realize uh, some of the things that we missed in that time. Um, this past weekend, I was actually in Las Vegas, New Mexico um, in, um, at the No False Solutions gathering uh, with the No False Solutions Coalition, which is mainly led by Pueblo Action Alliance. And um, they just... Uh, this is their third year having it. They actually canceled this one um, because they were going to have it, um, I think, like uh, a week after everything that had happened um, back in October. So, um, oh, no, no. They were supposed to have it a week after the shooting. You know, the shooting oh, in Española happened. And yes. then 10 days later, everything in Gaza started happening. And so, yeah, just crazy time to look, think back on. But anyways... Um, so they postponed it until now. And so I had the honor of going and uh, really just catching up on all of the work. I would see, you know, them post, um, you know, little things here and there, but um, they definitely laid out a timeline of everything that had happened. And I was just like, oh my God, like seeing it laid out like that just makes me realize like how, um, uh, you know, how, how, how I had overlooked it during this time, you know, understandably, but um, you know, PAA and the No False Solutions Coalition was successful in repealing hydrogen hubs from coming to New Mexico at all. Major. major. And I was just, I, I'm just so grateful for their work and their just relentless um, you know, opposition when it comes to going to the state legislature. You know, we don't really part Red Nation doesn't really participate in the whole legislative stuff, but I'm but I am just so grateful for the organizations that that do and who are doing that work in the background and you know these developments are happening and 
you know, I'm just, I'm just really proud of them. IEN was also there. Indigenous Climate Action was also there. Uh, Yucca was there. And there's a bunch of other organizations who do the environmental stuff here. Um, and I went with Patooch, who's been on their podcast. And I just, <laughs> I love hanging out with him. I'm, I'm like, what a legend. Uh, <laughs> yes, legendary elder. But he just, he just does like cool elder things too. Like, we went to go eat at El Potter Soul, and the if you've been at El Potter Soul, you know how like their salsa is. It is hot. It is hot, hot <laughs> salsa. He carried a container around for like the next six meals. <laughs> I was like, that is amazing. Like, like pro I, tips. I just haven't hung out with the elder like that in a long time. I feel like <laughs> it was oh, good. It awesome. was good. It was. And, um, you know, he's been involved in the anti-nuclear work in New Mexico for a really long time. But uh, and so we, we have those conversations and we um, he introduced me to some people. I got introduced to the director of Nuclear Savage, which Nuclear Savage was the first Red Nation event shown. And I'm like, you don't even understand your place in it Red was. Nation history. It was like, the very first event Red Nation ever hosted was a film and, screening of Nuclear Savage. At and that was also the event that Jen attended for the, that was the first event she attended for Red Nation. And that's what radicalized her into getting into Red Nation at all. I was like, you don't understand the like stake you have in our like organizational history. And you just like Pueblo history even. I was like, yeah, just an amazing weekend. But yeah, just thinking about those things, thinking about what we uh, didn't take the time to think about in the moment as these things were happening. And it, it was just a really great space to look back and, and really um, acknowledge these victories. Heck yeah. What, um, so can you talk a little bit more about what No False Solutions is? What is this coalition and what's like, what's their mission and, and the goal? Oh, sorry. Siri, not you. <laughs> I'm just trying to turn off my device. It's making sounds and I don't know how to mute it. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, um, so No False Solutions, um, they began organizing around um, carbon. Um, they, they were uh, organizing. They started going to all the COP conferences and um, they, I know that they went to uh, Glasgow. I think that was the same year that um, D had went also. But yeah, and they, they're kind of, they kind of talk about how these different COP conferences happen. Twenty twenty one, that was when it was in Glasgow. Yeah, and I think, I think they all started going around the same time. And so um, they, they kind of debrief about what's being said there. And um, I'm still unclear about what it what the COP conference actually is. But what I can gather is it's basically a market for energy and these like new energies that they're trying to promote. So um, the big thing a couple of years ago was getting carbon down to net zero which is like the most insidious thing that they do. Like at the No Fall Solutions conferences, they end up mainly talking about how these, um, you know, settler institutions are like purposely using their language to mix up your mind into thinking that they're doing something cool when really they're just doing something like really insidious. So yeah, the net zero movement is disgusting. <laughs> disgusting basically uh they make it so that these um these energy companies who are have tons of carbon emissions they can um buy um like farmland or forest land from like people like tribes and they can offset their carbon usage um by saying that well we have this much forest land that is producing enough oxygen to cover for how much carbon emissions that we're producing so they just end up creating more carbon and then there's this other thing where uh, they can buy carbon from other industries or other yeah and so like you know if there's two 
uh, smoke in columns and they're producing the same amount of emissions, the uh, one of the columns can buy up all the emissions of the other one and from other countries and from other places. And it's just it just ends up in a really gross cycle. And then, um, of course, like in recent, um, more recent times, they're trying to promote nuclear energy as clean energy. Oh, so insidious. Yeah. And then I guess um, even more recently, uh, hydrogen is like the big like push for toward energy. And hydrogen, from what I understand, I'm still kind of unclear about the actual process. But what I do know is it takes up tons and tons of water. And then there's this whole thing about trying to get produced water to to be used for hydrogen energy. And yeah, it's just it's just dirty energy still. So we're oh, cut. Uh, capitalism is so grotesque. Like it's literally like Frankenstein. Everything you're just describing, it's like capitalism doesn't want to stop. And so it's just like piecing together these like grotesque body parts and calling it like energy transition. Right. And it's I the I'm at a loss for words because it's just really hard to describe how again, I like just how disgusting the landscape looks. And I think this is what happens at COP. I think at COP, all of like the fancy countries, all of the imperial um kind of capitalist countries and corporations, they wine and dine together and they strike these bargains and these deals and they create these framework frameworks like net zero and cap and trade. Um to maintain their profits, but to like give the facade or like the appearance that they're engaged in like a renewable, a a transition to renewable energy sources. Meanwhile, right? Like you don't actually have to change. You don't have to reduce anything. None of them are actually reducing emissions at all. Like the primary producers of carbon emissions are not having to reduce any of their emissions, but they're just like, okay, for every, like, I don't even know if it's quantified. I bet you they've like They've hired scientists to quantify how much like planting a tree will offset a certain, I'm not actually sure how carbon emissions are measured, like the scientific measurement. Um, They they showed us the actual graphs that they use. They they use these whack ass like uh, math equations to determine that how much oxygen they commodify, like the literal oxygen that each tree can make. And then they use that to be like, well, this means we can produce this much carbon emissions. And it's, yeah, it's disgusting. And that's what a false solution is. Uh, I, to answer your question earlier. You're false, right. Solutions, yeah. <laughs> false solutions are like, this is a solution for the climate crisis. But, you know, what happened at the conference was actually... Um, a really cool moment I witnessed um, because it's not just, yeah, it's PAA and all these other indigenous environmental groups who are there, but it's also like um, a lot of like NGO white liberals who are in this space also who do a lot of the environmental work. And, um, you know, you know, you know how it is sometimes, but at this conference, I felt a sincere shift in the the just the way of thinking like people are 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 um very accepting of the idea i mean at the end of the conference they're like the the number one climate solution is demilitarization of the u.s and everybody was in agreement of that that's and, new um, yeah the yeah liberals yeah they're like no absolutely and i and i sincerely believe that's because of palestine Like, when we say Palestine is the tip of the spear, like, this is everything that follows, is that we are now living in a world where even, like, the everyday settler liberal is radicalized to, like, the minimum truth that, hey, the U.S. um, isn't going to be the 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 means to our climate solutions you know like they're they're finally coming to terms with the settler state and what it actually is you know what we've been saying this whole time but to see that like just stark difference in like vibe and energy like it it was very it was something to see and i was just so again i'm just so proud of them like um it was cool we even um I, I uh Julia had even asked me to uh, go be on the local radio 
<laughs> and I got to say that to like northern eastern New Mexico. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I was like, what did I say? I was like, Dem- I was like, demilitarization is the number one climate solution. Free Palestine if you want a just climate solution. And like uh, the radio host, she was like, yo, the phone started blowing up in a good way, in a good way. So it sounded like it was being received. Yeah, just from rugged proles in northeast New Mexico. Dude, this is the first time I have been a part of a conversation where the liberation and the decolonization of Palestine has been explicitly linked to the climate justice struggle. Thank you, thank you, actually, for that analysis and for like bridging that. Um, I mean, obviously, we talked about this in the Red Deal. Like, what is happening in Gaza just brings it, makes it so clear to the entire world. It is right. It really, it has made it so obvious that it cannot be ignored, even by the normies, as you would say. Um, and so, that's really profound, actually. I mean, I. I've been saying, you know, like what's happened, what happened on October 7th and just like the the powerful, like unwavering resistance of Palestinians and their refusal to leave their own homelands, right? And to relinquish their, their rightful ancestral place there. It is the tip of the spear, but it's also like, it has like changed world history overnight. And when I, when we said that, you know, when we wrote that speech that I delivered on November 4th, that like it has delivered a devastating blow to colonialism. I mean, it has de- delivered a devastating blow to colonialism and I believe capitalism on a on a scale that I could not have imagined and as swiftly as I could never have imagined. And so, I mean, the climate justice struggle is obviously a global struggle because, um, you know, like the whatever the, the climate change clock that we're facing, we're at like year 47 now till, you know, the, the end of time. <laughs> you know and like the planet becomes unlivable it's obviously like a threat to the entire planet and so i don't know it's like i I, sometimes i just get very yoded thinking about the scale of everything um and how decolonization is like an international and like a global struggle in a way that i feel like maybe it wasn't before absolutely and uh, there was another moment um, at the conference because they're also um, like, you know, like I was kind of demonstrating earlier. It's like a real mixed bag at these things of of the range of people that they bring. And so they do take the time to um, educate like on definitions, on even like uh, there's a section where they did like the four keywords behind um the no false solutions and they use the words capitalism colonization patriarchy and development they're like these are the things that create a false solution and i was like you know absolutely yeah i was like absolutely they like the the quiet parts are completely uncovered like they are no longer quiet parts like it is like this is the reasons and so you know, when I, when I, you know, when it was my turn to talk, I, I uh, was like, you know, these four words are also this, this is the political ideology behind uh, what is this false solution. But even beyond that, this, this is the political ideology behind um, the settler colonial projects, you know, the United States, Canada, Israel, and um, just going into like, just really diving into how these settler colonial states don't have the right to exist and it's actually up to us to determine like how um how we create a a future like a future period like not just like for indigenous people but like you know i use the red deal line like we all need clean water it's not just an indian problem it truly is decolonization or extinction and yeah and so demonstrating that relation to um you know settler identity and settler colonial projects settler states um and demonstrating how like the ideologies behind false solutions and these liberal solutions are the same thing i feel like really just got a lot of the gears going for a lot of people like when i said after i said that on the radio show 
it was like a domino effect because I, I was on there with like um there was there was one woman who was about my age she was from chicago but the rest of the people um who were on that they were youth they're native youth and like once once that was said you know that the u the demilitarization is the number one climate solution it was a domino effect for the youth they they like lit up and they're just like wow. free they're like free palestine on the on the radio so i i i needed that that was a medicine <laughs> thank you paa again i can't think of them enough like to be in that space to witness people light up like that to see the radicalization of of white liberals like i was god i just needed that after all this time yeah i mean like every single day you're just seeing like literal carnage um and the footage coming out of gaza and it's like soul crushing um and that is obviously one of the most important struggles for decolonization of our time um, the cost and, and the price is really high. And so it's genocide. And so you're just watching genocide every day and trying your best to do what you can to stop it. Um, and I think being able to pivot to like this, like what PAA did, right? What you're saying, it felt like medicine. Um, reading the stories about the dam removal and like the Yurok tribe, even I think it was last year, they put a moratorium on their own fishing and consumption of salmon from the river because they realized even their own very small scale compared to like the commercial um, fishing and harvesting of salmon by corporations um, and the pollution of the river that has caused a lot of salmon die off, that even their very small consumption um, in salmon fishing practices was already also having an effect on the population. And it would be like if the net people, um, just basically decided to stop eating sheep <laughs> you know, for an entire year or longer because we understood that the sheep population needed to come back um, because the sheep is our relative, right? Sheep is life is this phrase that we use. And for the Yurok, I don't know if they say salmon is life, but that's basically the same idea. Like their identity of who they are is they are salmon and the salmon is them. And so for them to make the decision to put like a stop to their own relationship for that the time being with the salmon so that the salmon could come back and flourish that also the whole story is like medicine for me is the reason why i'm saying this um i just i don't know it really speaks to just like the persistence and the badassery and the brilliance uh of indigenous people and that decolonization is a long road it's a long struggle we're seeing lots of examples of how to do it and what, not how to do it, but what must happen in order for decolonization to happen in this moment. Um, but yeah, these are, these are examples that I feel like I had not, I had not paid attention to lately. Um, and it feels good to pay attention to them because they're real and they can be trusted and they're very powerful. They're as powerful as any other, you know, strategy, I would say, for decolonization um, that we have participated in or that we're seeing unfold in this moment. It truly is like a by any means necessary um, kind of moment for decolonization. And again, I'm just reflecting, I'm not sure I've ever quite seen that um, come to fruition before. And like real gains, like Indigenous people are making like real gains. I'm also thinking about um, the land return to the Ohlone peoples in Berkeley. Like, this two acres that was a parking lot, <clears throat> this happened like two weeks ago or 10 days ago, this happened 10 days ago. Um, they've been struggling. So the Ohlone, uh, I'm assuming, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in collaboration with some other folks put together a land trust. I, I don't know what year this came about, but it was like the first example of kind of like a settler land tax that was implemented in a US city, if I recall. And so all these years later, they have successfully um, been able to procure a, a really important, it's a shell mound, um, like an extremely important, like cultural, spiritual and ancestral site that is in the heart of Berkeley. That's literally a parking lot that these developers were trying to build, you know, housing on. Um, and so we're seeing like, that's a very long struggle as well, right? That being the first kind of settler land tax in a city. And then today, 
they've been able to actually get land back through partly through that process. That also just lifted my spirit when I saw that news also come across my screen. I also feel like that was maybe underreported, but yeah, also just like, uh, again, just another really important example and a, a brilliant strategy actually for land back and decolonization because decolonization requires actual land back. That's probably another thing that has shifted because of Palestine in like the psyche of kind of normal American settlers. They're really like, oh shit, like land back is a real thing. It's not just a tagline. You know, people are putting a hashtag on social media, like decolonization requires actual land back. And I do also think that Palestine has been very instrumental in in waking people up to that um, and making them realize that 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 has to happen also in the United States. Oh, I was going to say something else about demilitarization, if that's okay. I'm rambling a bit. I'm a little out of practice with the podcast talking. But, you know, under the Red Deal, we talk about um, an abolitionist approach. Like, so demilitarization is primarily, I mean, obviously demilitarization, like the end of U.S. imperialism is like the best climate justice strategy for healing the planet, right? From the ravages of capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism. But in order to demilitarize, you would um, actually require like taking the resources, divesting from the infrastructure, military infrastructure. Of course, um, I I forgot how much of US taxpayer money goes towards military things in the United States, but it's massive, right? It's like billions of dollars of US taxpayer money. And so you divest, you take that money, that is being um, invested in instruments, the primary instrument of harm around the globe, which is the US military, you divest that and you reinvest it in other things, whether it's remediation work for where dirty like fossil fuel extraction, right, has created lots of pollution in a certain place, or you're creating jobs for like a transition to clean energy of a certain kind. Um, But you're reinvesting that money in like education and in healthcare, right? Um, The kinds of things that everyday people and the planet and all of our other than human relatives need and deserve in order to live a full life. Meaning like there's not a shortage of resources. Capitalism wants us to think that there's a shortage of resources um, on the planet, but there's not a shortage of resources. They're just like unevenly distributed. This is why the birth of a billionaire every week (laughs) during the pandemic and in 2023, like it just demonstrates so clearly that there's not a shortage of resources. The resources are hoarded by the ruling class like the very, the 1%, right? The 1%. And so if we take that, we take those resources and we redistribute them amongst kind of the commons, then that creates the healing and the path forward that we need. And going back to the removal of the dams um, along the Klamath River. So that project costs $450 million, which is half a, almost half a billion dollars but a drop in the bucket compared to like how much of our tax money goes towards the military, um, which is also like massacring and genociding Palestinians, right? Um, and terrorizes the entire rest of the world. But I found out that 200 million of that. So, okay, so Warren Buffett's corporation um, that owns like the subsidiary that runs these dams, it's a public utility, Pacific Corps. From what I can tell, the corporation itself is not paying any money to remove these dams, even though they said that it was the cheapest option. The money is coming from taxpayers. So California, um, California voters voted to, um, voted for a bond, um, which I think comes from like mostly from the general fund of California, which is paid for by tax, which the money for the general fund comes from tax money, California taxes. Um, So that's comprising, I think it's 250 million or 200 million of the 450 million and then the other part, the I think it's the 250 million is coming from the the people who uh, what do they call them rate payers for the utilities. So these dams provide like a, a kind of a nominal amount of electricity, and I don't know where that electricity goes, which towns or cities or whatever. Um, but the people who are using the electricity, probably residentially and commercially, commercially have now been paying like more, they pay a surcharge on top of their regular utility bill. And the accumulation of this surcharge comprises the other 200, $250 million of this $450 million that's required to move remove these four dams. Okay, the reason why I'm talking about this very boring kind of math about tax money is that 
on the one hand, it is an interesting example, perhaps, of like settler accountability for land back, meaning like instead of our taxes going towards instruments of harm, we're going to pay tax money and we're going to increase like what we're paying for the public utility. The public utility is based on the dispossession and the continued harm, right, of indigenous relatives, i.e. the salmon and the water. So it's a kind of like reparations in a way that I find that's very interesting. But at the same time, it's very disturbing that the corporation itself, which is owned by a billionaire, by a one percenter, is not being held accountable financially. So if we talk about this in the Red Deal, right, that the, the biggest polluters are the people who also need to be paying for like the cleanup work um, that's caused by extraction and just like the ravages of capitalism. But it just got my wheels turning about that. Um, it would be really nice to see Pacific Core um, it'd be really nice to see this billionaire, <laughs> you know, Warren Buffett, who everybody is like, oh, like everyone wanted to be Warren Buffett like 20 years ago because he's like an OG billionaire. But it'd be nice to see him put some money towards that. Because again, 450 million is a drop in the bucket compared to how much money is made from and goes into the military industrial complex. Absolutely. Uh, climate debt. They owe us climate debt. Yes, that is the word or the phrase. Yeah, no, I, I try to bring up that word every single time. Uh, well, not every single, the last two times that I've spoken publicly, I did go to a Palestine action uh, here in Albuquerque. Do you, okay, that was another one. Oh my God. That was um, the weekend for All Out for Rafa. And um, it was just me and then another friend of the Red Nation here in Albuquerque, Lauren. She went with me. We both went, offered car support. Um, but I called Samia maybe like 10 minutes before we left the office and she's like, you're going to speak today. <laughs> and so, so I did. So I, I, uh, I, I read the, I read the speech that we wrote and, um, but uh, actually, if you want to hear what I said, please subscribe to our Patreon. Sina put the audio of that speech, and it is a patron exclusive recording. So, <laughs> for as little as two dollars a month, you can hear what I had to say that day. <laughs> but um, <laughs> just, uh, just let me shamelessly plug it real quick. But <laughs> that's cool. Um, but that one was was amazing because uh, I did acknowledge um that the Red Nation especially here in Albuquerque, hasn't been on the ground. And we all know why. It was because of the shooting. Everybody understands why. But they were so psyched to see that Red Nation had a presence that day. Like, I literally just walked out and I said, hi, my name's Justine and I'm with the Red Nation. Boom. Just, like, explosion. <laughs> you can hear it on the audio. Like, I remember the moment in person, but then I listened to the audio. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> but, um... But yeah, I oh, the the last two times I spoke hu publicly, I've said climate debt specifically, and I think that's a phrase that gets the gears going in a lot of people. And I feel like um, we're at a point where collectively we like um, it is more collectively known who the perpetrator is. I just you know the the hope in the U.S. has really died in in the last few months in particular i don't know anybody left of center who is who has any kind of allegiance to the u.s like they used to and i feel like um the ideas that were very radical in the red deal at the time of the of release are being are that's like that's like the baseline like politics right now for for leftist movement you know um be in everyone left of center and again palestine we got to credit them it, that has been the one unifying issue to uh, for everybody left of center and it's also and and in that it's unlocked all of these um acceptances to the reality what we've been shouting for years you know people <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. I just also I also just feel like liberals are in a place where they are genuinely in a place of discomfort. Like 
like it's finally coming to their 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 front doors their front you know they're they're seeing genocide from their from their hands in their phone like yeah i you know i also talked to samia yesterday too we're really having a moment just talking about the devastation in gaza and um but in that conversation there was also like but let us remember the resistance happening you know like none of this can be in vain like the immense death and destruction and genocide and evil just unleashed into the world like that with no regard to anything sacred anything good anything life itself like absolutely no regard like the most utter evil that's ever been unleashed like in human history nobody's been bombed this way before like it will not and it cannot be in vain like i sincerely believe that mother earth herself will not allow this to be in vain like i mean i'm you know might be talking like in a in a like kind of i don't know like i guess spiritual kind of way right now about it in terms of like what does justice mean but you know, and I can't say what the future is going to be right now. I think we're coming up on the eclipses, FYI, if we want to talk about that later. But <laughs> but I just feel, I feel it in my bones. Like, like the, the tide will turn. Like, you can't, you, like, this, this just unprecedented unbalance that has happened. Like, you know... <sighs> You know, and, and, you know, going back to it's not just an Indian problem, like, 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 I don't know, I, I maybe people are, are seeing what's happening and, and they're coming to terms with with all of it, including like the the climate um, catastrophe that we're on the cusp on right now. Like, like, I've always wondered to myself, like, have uh, like I've, I've been I've been like deeply afraid of like, am I going to be thirsty one day? And I feel like maybe other people are asking themselves the same kinds of questions. And so when you say that the U.S. owes us climate debt, these these companies owe us climate debt, like I just just that bare like demand, I think is something I think like we can be, you know, we wrote the Red Deal and I feel like we're at a point where we can begin to actually execute the Red Deal like climate justice is going to take nothing short of revolution nothing short of revolution i mean it really is decolonization or extinction literally literally and i i think we're living it like i think what palestine dragged us all and by us i mean like the all people on the planet um into the phase now where we're like living decolonization or extinction. And I don't plan to let extinction happen <laughs> as an indigenous person, <laughs> you know, here, like that ain't gonna happen. And so you gotta pick a side. You gotta pick a side. Are you gonna pick the side of decolonization? Are you gonna pick the side of extinction? Cause like capitalism, that's the side of extinction, you know, settler colonialism and imperialism and, you know, bombs, that's the side of extinction. And like, I. I picked the other side a long time ago, but now we're like living it. And again, it's, it's happening in so many ways, but I, I believe, I believe that the struggle for decolonization, it's going to take a while. And it's, it's obviously horrific. Like again, the cost and the price is really high, but I believe it's going to happen in like a very big way um, on a planetary level. And I just remember, you know, in the bathroom, in the, the bathroom in the Red Nation office in Albuquerque, we have a poster and it has Berta Cáceres, speaking of dams. So Berta Cáceres, right? Um, indigenous woman who was assassinated for the work that she was doing um, to about dams um, and how dams are interfering, right? With the indigenous, the livelihood of her people. And the, the, the poster is in Spanish but it says like, Berta no se murió, se multiplicó, which means Berta didn't die, she multiplied. That's what that means. 
And so I think we're in a moment right now where all of the martyrs, the martyrs, um, they didn't die, they multiplied. <laughs> and so we're in the moment of where there is both simultaneously massive death, but also massive multiplication, right? And so those two things are going hand in hand. And it's like, it's a lot, it's a lot to bear and to carry every single day. But I believe that is actually what's happening. And I have, I have faith and I have, I have all the hope, not because I'm a dumbass liberal, you know, engaged in like smudging and burning man. (laughs) That's not where my hope comes from. I don't believe that the vote will save me. Right. I don't believe that Joe Biden is a better choice than Trump because all of these things are being said right now is like the, the basis of hope in this broken ass empire. Um, our hope is a hope that is like founded in reality and truth and experience as indigenous people who survive colonization, continue to survive colonization. So. No se murió, se multiplicó. Thank you for saying that, Melanie. I, yeah, it is, it is so important to remember that. And it is such a disservice to think anything otherwise because the martyrs in Gaza didn't die, they multiplied. And there are real world um, implications happening right now that that we're seeing. Um, Wow, what a a thing to say and acknowledge. It's just a poster. It's a poster in the Red Nation office in our bathroom. (laughs) All places, but every time I'm there, I read it and I'm just like, I carry it. I, I carry that message in my heart. We also have uh, Palestinian political prisoners, Larry Casus, and uh, uh, I can't remember who it is, but we have another lady hitting Nazis with her purse. We have bathroom art in the Larry Casus Freedom <laughs> Center. <laughs> and just because those posters are in the bathroom does not mean they have like a, a, a lesser status than the stuff that is in the main room. It's just we have actually so much political art. We just needed to find wall space for all of it. <laughs> In our shitty office, our shitty asbestos-filled office. Anyway, oh god, we're we're moving though. Um, and uh, actually, I was thinking it'd be cool to um host a film screening at wherever we land up with uh another film screen of Nuclear Savage. That'd be kind of cool. That was the first TRN event ever, and then again at the new place. <sighs> Sorry, I got a little off track. <laughs> well, no, I mean, okay, so we're back around to Nuclear Savage and kind of the inception of the Red Nation back in, I think we that film screening was in November of 2014 was when we screened that film. And the fact that, so I gave a presentation, I was on a panel uh, about, called The Nuclear Now, that was sponsored by some great folks at the University of California, Santa Cruz, I know. And I was the only person on the panel who doesn't do work like exclusively on nuclearism um, or like activism on, on nuclear development. And so I was, I've also been writing this chapter for this Navajo Nation textbook and looking a lot at the history of nuclear development in the Navajo Nation and like uranium contamination and irradiation and extraction, et cetera. And I haven't, the, you know, the anti-nuclear movement, like in the late 70s and early 80s, was one of the most important, if not the most important kind of um, expression of the environmental justice movement in the United States at that time. And I feel like anti-nuclear work is not really thought of in that way anymore. It's not considered like the most pressing issue, nuclear development, but it is. Because all of a sudden, like the ruling class, right, and, and and the governments that are like in their pocket, have just been like, it's like a like in Lord of the Rings where it's like meat's back on the menu, boys. <laughs> like nukes are back on the menu, boys. Like this this will save the planet. This is where our new energy source will come from. And I'm like, what? Like my people are still dying from like the the largest uranium spill in U.S. history in Church Rock, you fuckers. <laughs> like, how are you saying that this is something that's like 
back on the menu. You didn't even clean up the first round. Yeah. No, uh, there was yesterday there was a um the last like closing session that they did with the no false solutions gathering, there was a um presentation from the Los Alamos study group who have been um, part of like the anti-nuclear coalition here in New Mexico. And they're just going over some of like the newer stats and stuff. And, um, and Paduchin and I uh, helped with that presentation. But during that, when they were going over their facts and everything, they're saying that the number one fed interest right now in New Mexico is nuclear. Like, like they said, that is the number one thing that the feds look to New Mexico for, which I mean, like, I, I like them saying out loud, like, I was just like, holy shit. Like, I mean, we like we know this, but like to hear it out loud like that after the presentation was just like, holy shit. Like, how could I how could I forget or how could I not forget? But I don't know. Just put it on the back burner, I guess. And like it, it, it's just an insane thing to hear um god right? I even, I even know, yeah i don't even know what to go after that but it, that shit was insane again the frankenstein approach to saving the planet it's, yeah unless yeah maybe that's also an apt metaphor because frankenstein's already dead right it was like literally it's like literally a, a zombie yeah we're like living but, zombie capitalism like we're living we're living decolonization and zombie capitalism like simultaneously and it is wild the wild <laughs> only one can win yep again you gotta choose the side you gotta pick the side decolonization or zombie capitalism yeah it's uh i feel like it's an easy choice <laughs> 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 i don't know about um, you know yeah have you uh do you remember on <laughs> i'm gonna make a joke but you remember on uh american horror story when um what's her name uh uh she's an elder actress oh, i can't remember her name she's real pretty but anyway um that one line she says like there's not gonna be a pool you stupid slut like <laughs> That's how, that's how I feel about the election. I'm like, there's not going to be an election, you stupid slut. <laughs> Jessica, which was like, uh, who was that person? Oh, God. Just, just, uh, Je Lang? Jessica, Jessica Lang. Lang. Yeah. Oh, what a queen, first of all. Yeah. I, wish this, I wish I could still watch Jessica Lang on television, but that's all, that's another time. That's a story. <laughs> I was like devastated when she retired from American Horror Story, and then I kind of stopped watching after that. Anyway. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's going to be an election. I don't know if I should say this on the public record. Um, things are unraveling. You know, you got like zombie capitalism, just like, just work going. It's hard. As we've said before, like it has its whole ass out. Like you're trying to revive and nukes as like a option for the world. Like, come on. <laughs> It's like the Death Star. Anyway, and so that's just one example. There, there's another um, uh, fun fact that they gave us during the presentation. LANO, Los Alamos National Labs, uh, the ones responsible for creating the atomic bomb. In, our, in, in mine and Jen's Sacred Mountains, by the way. But they hired 5,000 new LANO workers in the last five years. No. Oh, it's happening. Yeah, and they know this. They know, and 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 they said in the presentation that the U.S. does this to maintain escalation dominance. And during my bit, when I when I was speaking um, in the same presentation, I was like, "Why does the U.S. need escalation dominance? Why? Because that is the amount of violence it takes." to maintain their ideology it is it is maintained by violence alone that is the amount that is an extreme amount of violence to the point where you have to produce 300 nukes a year to maintain that status because that's how illegitimate it is and i think i think that is like the big elephant in the room right now no 
I, right? Like settler colonialism is pure violence, period. No matter what form, it could be police, it could be military, it could be the ideology, it could be the institution of settler citizenship and the way that Indian killing is baked into all of that, for example, um, and counterinsurgency is baked into the very identity and fabric of U.S. nationalism and citizenship and settler citizenship. But yeah, settler colonialism, and of course, well, mostly settler colonialism can only be maintained through violence. Um, I, what has happened in Palestine demonstrates that very clearly. Um, and so escalation dominance is like a fascinating phrase. I'm going to be doing some research on this and thinking about it because escalation dominance perfectly describes like where zombie capitalism is right now. It's really a, again, it's like on steroids, it has escalated for sure, but that's because I think also simultaneously, right, the movement for decolonization is extremely effective in this moment. The fort is breached and the wagons are burning. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't I know you're not a, a SpongeBob head like how the rest of us are, but <laughs> I vowed to watch SpongeBob so I would understand what you guys great. are talking about. Just okay, I'll put it on my to-do list. <laughs> But uh, there's this scene where SpongeBob needs to know only fine, fine dining and breathing. So in his head, he has a bunch of little SpongeBobs in his brain running around and everything's on fire. And they're they're uh, putting all the, the documents in the file shredder. Like, <laughs> they're freaking out right now. And I, I mean, you know, not to make light of anything, of, of the devastation of, of anything right now. But, you know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. That is what is happening. The escalation that they have demonstrated. They, it is, it is a demonstration of a complete lack of control. And, you know, I, I, I saw a random like headline. Uh, I can't remember what social media platform it was. And I'm not even sure if it's true, but I know it's true in essence for sure. But there was some is Israeli leader who said the other day that was like Hamas has won the war. And yeah, just, yeah, that just outright saying that's why I'm like questioning uh, the, the source. But even if this is like something made up or whatever, we already know that's where it's going. And in, in terms of, like, ideology, they have already lost the war. Like, they've proven that. They've proven that because of the amount of escalation that they have to maintain just to stay an illegitimate settler state the way that Israel is. Yeah. 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 And they're not... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Say what you're going to say. I was going to say something stupid. I was going to say something stupid. Uh, okay. Um, not to be that guy, but the age of Aquarius is here. Oh, God. Yes, not to be that astrology bitch. <laughs> no, on the drive home yesterday, I was telling Vitooch about Pluto being an Aquarius, and he was so fascinated. <laughs> okay, that shit is fascinating, and it is partly the framework in addition to, you know, like politics and theory and history that I am reading this moment through. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Pluto and Aquarius, look it up. It's a big deal. It only happens like every 200 years or something. I was listening to the astrology podcast where they were talking about Pluto and the symbolism behind it. And one of the astrologers said that Pluto has a way of making the big things small and the small things big. Shortly after Pluto was discovered, so was the discovery of the of atoms. Like, yeah, isn't that Yoded? That's and so then... Good. Yeah, and then Aquarius uh, represents things like uh, humanitarianism and society and things like that. So just those two energies alone can like uh, sort of peek you into what that means if you're into that. I always say not to be that guy, and my, I'm always the only guy who's saying this, but <laughs> I'm TRN's uh, in-house astrology ho, not going to lie. <laughs> you know what? We need we need that. 
when it, that. it's so interesting it's, it's just interesting yeah i i get yoded but it, i mean the time the times of now are truly unprecedented and i think the if there was a veil before it is completely removed right now yeah i was actually gonna say it's funny that we already went to a yoded place with the pluto and aquarius comment i was gonna say it if was this wasn't really happening i would just be outrageously yoded be like uh i listened to your episode you did with jen uh last week about mother god anyway just doing like <laughs> so many hallucinogens <laughs> I just like you know, outrageously yoded and I like am completely detached from reality. Um, yeah, no, if I, what, what, what we're experiencing right now is actually stranger than probably going on a yoke trip. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have one last comment on Pluto and Aquarius that I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm yeah. only mentioning this because this is a segue into um, next week's or no, uh, well, this upcoming week, we're going to be recording with Mackenzie and um, next month we'll be releasing that episode. So please keep an eye out about what's to come with that. We're going to talk about um, the what had happened in Albuquerque public schools a few years ago when um, that teacher, Miss Easton, had cut off three inches of a Native student's braid and then called um, our comrade's sister a bloody Indian uh, while trying to, trying to feed them dog food. Like, I, yeah, I totally forgot the, like, details of it all. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, so keep an eye out for these episodes. Um, please uh, support the show by becoming a patron to support our media work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, during that conversation when me and Jen were meeting with her I was like just the uncovering of everything that was happening I was like this is yoded Pueblo and Aquarius shit right now how how crazy is it that we're having this conversation right now about how you were treated in your high school classroom and how this had all happened and literally just like like uh, at the time, two nights ago, was the release of that new documentary, uh, "Quiet on the Set." Have you heard about that one? It's yeah. all, it's all, it's it's all the talk on social media right now, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know or who have been uh, not active on the social medias, uh, there was a like just huge documentary that came out the other day that has revealed the child abuse and molestation that has happened on Nickelodeon sets and other uh, children's programming from when I was a kid. These are the shows that I was watching. Um, I was a big fan of The Amanda Show, big fan of Drake and Josh, and then um, then I started growing up, but my sister was watching the other ones like iCarly, Victorious, and all that. But yeah, just all that to say that if there was a veil before, it's completely removed now. And I see how that that reoccurring theme in just all levels of society at the moment. And so, you know, we're in a really weird place right now and we're really devastated. But, you know, underneath all of that, like, I feel like there's just immense hope to be found. Yeah. And a lot of work to do. I was, uh, I... <laughs> So much happens all the time that I can't hold all of it like present, like at the front of my my mind as a consideration. Uh, and that's like really messed up because these are major things. I mean, like the shooting that happened on September 28th, where um, you guys almost died that day. Um, it was an assassination attempt, essentially. And it, it was a failed mass shooting. It was a failed mass shooting, but it was also like an assassination. Like there was a, a political motive behind it. Um, and certainly Red Nation people, including you, were, you know, on that list. Let's be honest. That's exactly what that was about. And other Native people. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you read, mentioned this like earlier on in this episode that like Red Nation hadn't been out doing anything for months. And when you went to speak at the Palestine rally, um, when the all out for Rafa is that what you were talking about? The one that happened in Albuquerque, I think it was that Friday. Um, everyone was cheering, but and everyone like understood why Red Nation hadn't really been boots on the ground. And 
I had actually been feeling very guilty recently. And even after everything popped off on October 7th and the Palestine solidarity work in the U S like, you know, rose to a level and like a fever pitch I've never seen before. And I was like doing my best to contribute, um, to a coalition here, but I just felt like I couldn't keep up. And I was like, just kind of being like, what the hell, what's wrong with me? Like, am I an organizer or not? <laughs> you know? Like, I can't believe I, like in this moment where really good organizing is like so needed, I felt like a failure kind of, and I've been feeling that way a little bit, but it is actually important to remember that like the repression and the cost and the price, it, it just because there's so much constantly coming at you because of the yodedness of the time that we're in. Like you can't ever, you can't even like process like your near death experience or the death of people who you love because it just keeps happening. And it's, it's the, the pace is really intense. And so I guess the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm looking forward to the red nation getting back to more organizing it, and what I was reading about this like 20 year struggle that all of these like Yurok people were engaged in and how much, how much work and organizing that must have taken to remove those dams. I'm just like, man, I want to do that again. Like Red Nation has done that kind of work before, like the work that Pueblo Action Alliance is doing. Like we have done that kind of work before and we have paid a big price for the work that we've done. It's true. We've been around long enough. We've been around a decade now and we've been around long enough that there have been like some sacrifices that have, have been made. And there are things that have like really affected our lives as people doing this work, but I'm just really looking forward to what the red nation can contribute in like a concrete way to this really beautiful multiplication of the decolonization struggle that we're seeing unfold in this moment. Um, yeah. I also wanted to tell you, you did some slip when you were talking earlier and you said Pueblo in Aquarius instead of Pluto in Aquarius. <laughs> so, I want to say Pueblo in Aquarius needs to be your online astrology handle and the name of your like tarot card business if you're into that. <laughs> you know what i actually am a pueblo in aquarius my moon and saturn's there i mean it was, not a it was something I, I marked it that is like, so this funny like very significant that you just said pueblo in aquarius instead of pluto oh my god that's so funny <laughs> e very on brand though because that that is has been what's happening um i don't want to go into any details uh while we're recording but the lead some of the leaders in public action alliance was telling me about um like uh just just i, I guess pueblo repression that they're also going through too and i just you know um i'm i'm also i you know i i i, I um, I don't want to say too much on, on the camera, we're, we're, you know, but, but I just, I too want the Red Nation to get back in the ring with all of this. I too felt very guilty about um, sort of being incapacitated to go as hard as we used to. And, um, you know, I, I find myself just looking forward to May when we have our GA and really just getting into the just just uh the nitty gritty of <clears throat> what who we are organizationally i was thinking about this yesterday too actually um who is the red nation in this moment or who have we become and where are we going um and i think that's natural to any organization that does this kind of work um with the developing material conditions and how things have played out over the past few years and it's okay like i think it's okay I think it's okay that we were forced to 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 take the time that we had to and you know and, and yet maintain the capacity that we did, you know, hold the space that we did, reach the masses through our podcasting the way that we did. And um no regrets in that part at all, but I just 
yeah, it's time. It's time to get back in the ring. It's time to really organize Gun Ho. Um, I have a feeling that um, in this moment, we can really utilize the Red Deal the way that we had intended it, intended it to be used. It was very accepted at the gathering. And, you know, I, I know that we can um, get other organizations to adopt that kind of, you know, ideology. And also, like, just nothing but t- total respect and love and support for all of the the long, what did John Redhouse um, call them the long distance runners, the patouches, <laughs> um, to the long distance runners and even like the new comrades and relatives who have been doing incredible organizing work. Um, kind of like well, Red Nation has been kind of absent, I guess, kind of on the ground and community based stuff, uh, just really moving mountains. And it's, I don't know, it's really inspiring and yeah, just excited to get, as you say, back in the ring and to catch up, to catch up with where other people have, have gone and taken the work uh, in really powerful directions. Absolutely. And just to take it back to astrology, I find it so fitting because the astrology, the astro- the astrological new year just began a couple of days ago when the sun moved into Aries. Oh, that's so, right. yeah, so we, we have another fresh start to go by. Uh, there's multiple new years. Like I say that every time, like I'll say that for uh, when the grass grows green again in June. I'd be like, it's happy new year's. Like <laughs> new year, happy new year's is a. Uh, Let's see, we've got the calendar new year, we've got Chinese new year, zodiac new year, and then uh got the Navajo New Year. year. You have like oh, the yeah, Navajo Navajo the you year. have like yeah, you have the Lakota New Year, like there's a lot of things. But yeah, it's it's always a refreshing energy, and I very much feel it right now. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I hope you also feel refreshed and feel the refreshing energy. I know it's I know shit is hard. I know I kind of fumbled through the podcast today, um, getting back and in, getting back into the saddle, getting back into the ring with podcasting too. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to to being here again on the podcast whenever that happens. The goal is every two weeks, but that may not happen because life is crazy. <laughs> but thanks for joining, Justine. Thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs>